One of the biggest mistakes I see science fiction authors and world builders make is neglecting the star that their world orbits, treating it like it's nothing more than a light source. But your star is the literal heart of your planetary system, and its properties greatly influence the properties of all of the planets that orbit it. So in this video, I'm going to help you determine the right star for your planetary system. There are a lot of different stars in the universe, but generally they can be slotted into one of four categories. Early stage stars, main sequence stars, late stage stars, and stellar remnants. Early stage stars are newly formed substellar objects that have not yet achieved the core conditions necessary for sustained nuclear fusion and instead glow from the heat of their gravitational collapse. During their evolution, which lasts for about 10 million years, they are prone to intense X-ray and ultraviolet flares, large coronal mass ejections, and strong stellar winds. Stars in this category include T Tauri stars and Herbig AE and BE stars. Main sequence stars are stellar objects that are actively fusing hydrogen in their cores. It is within this stage that a star will spend the majority of its existence, with high mass main sequence stars lasting around 10 million years and low mass stars lasting over 1 trillion years. Stars within this category include red dwarfs, yellow sun-like stars, and blue stars, among others. Late stage stars, sometimes called dying stars, are stars that have expended their supply of fusible hydrogen and have begun fusing heavier elements, growing larger and more luminous in the process. This final stage of a star's evolution lasts for between 100 million and 2 billion years, depending on the mass of the star. Stars in this category include subgiants, red giants, and wolf rayet stars. And lastly, we have stellar remnants, colloquially known as dead stars. These are what remain after a star has ceased all nuclear fusion and shed the majority of its mass, producing either a planetary nebula, as is the case of low mass stars, or a core collapse supernova, as is the case of high mass stars. These hyperdense objects spin rapidly and produce vast amounts of both electromagnetic and nuclear radiation. Objects within this category include white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. Which categories of stars you are able to choose from when crafting your planetary system depends on what type of inhabited world you're wanting to place in orbit around it. Inhabited worlds in science fiction typically fall into one of three categories. Settled worlds, terraformed worlds, and evolved worlds. A settled world is an inhospitable planet on which some alien species, be it human or otherwise, have built self-contained structures to provide for all of their environmental, biological, and technological needs. A domed city on a desolate planet would be an example of a settled world. The great thing about settled worlds is that they do not necessarily depend on the system's star for energy or the planet's environment for habitability, and they don't have to exist for long, astronomically speaking. They may be a research outpost that has to exist for a few months to a few years, or they may be a more substantial colony that needs to exist for several decades to maybe even a few centuries. In either case, such a time span is mere drop in the bucket for even the shortest lived stars. Because of this, a settled world could potentially be placed around most stars. Early stage stars are actively building planets, and so there won't be any stable ground on which to construct a settlement until very late into this stage, around 8 to 9 million years in. Even at this point, an early stage system is a dangerous place. In addition to the star's hyperactivity, the occurrence of meteoric impacts remains high, and all of the planets are hot, volcanic, and highly radioactive. A settlement placed on a planet around an early stage star would have to be extremely well shielded to survive. It's possible, but not recommended. Main sequence stars, on the other hand, are usually quite stable and are always a good choice for a settled world, except for the really high mass stars. Spectral type O stars are too luminous and short-lived to even have planets, and this is likely also the case for high mass spectral type B stars. Most late stage stars are also a good fit for a settled world, provided it is in the early part of this stage. You don't want to wait until such a star is in its final death throes, lest your settlement find itself on a planet in the path of the star's expanding outer layers. Stellar remnants don't always have planets, and even when they do, they are very dangerous environments. Like with early stage stars, a settlement on a planet around a stellar remnant would absolutely have to possess extremely strong shielding. You could potentially place a settled world around a stellar remnant, but I wouldn't want to visit it. Terraformed worlds are inhospitable planets on which some alien species, again, be it human or otherwise, have deployed technology to alter the planet's native environment and transform it into one that can provide for their environmental and biological needs. 
Unlike settled worlds, terraformed worlds do depend on their star for the energy necessary to maintain their climates. So a star must be able to provide a relatively steady stream of energy and a safe environment for a period lasting at least a few thousand years. This immediately rules out all early stage stars and stellar remnants as their environments are way too dangerous and their energy output too weak and erratic. Main sequence stars are usually your best bet for a terraformed world, again excluding the very high mass stars in the category. Late stage stars can also be a good choice for terraformed worlds, if the planet is terraformed within the first few million years of this stage. The star's luminosity will increase during the lifespan of the terraformed world, but it may not be enough to matter depending on how long that lifespan is. Plus, the planet could be terraformed to start out on the cold side so that it would transition to being more comfortable as the star aged, thus extending its habitability. Evolved worlds are habitable planets that have independently developed their own native biospheres. In other words, alien planets. These are probably the most prevalent type of world in science fiction, but they also carry the strictest dependencies. For a planet to develop anything beyond single-celled organisms, its star must maintain a stable energy output and a relatively safe environment for at least a few hundred million years, and more likely a few billion. This rules out early stage stars, late stage stars, and stellar remnants. For a biosphere to evolve on the surface of a planet, it requires a main sequence star. Main sequence stars come in seven varieties, which are delineated by their spectral types. These are often represented by the colors red, orange, yellow, white, light blue, blue, and dark blue. And unfortunately, this is where a lot of science fiction authors make a huge mistake by choosing the star for their planetary system based solely on its color aesthetic. Don't do this. These are not decorative colors. Main sequence stars are different colors because they have different properties. And it's important that you choose the star with the right properties for your world. The main sequence stars with the lowest mass and lowest temperatures are spectral type M stars. Also called M dwarfs or red dwarfs, these are the most numerous type of star in the universe and they are also the longest lived, having lifespans that can stretch from over 40 billion years to several trillion. Indeed, the universe is not yet old enough for any red dwarf to have left the main sequence. These stars favor the formation of terrestrial planets with Jovian planets being somewhat rare. As a rule of thumb, only about 1 in 15 M dwarf systems has a Neptune mass planet, and only about 1 in 50 have a Jupiter mass planet. They also tend to be very compact systems, with their planets orbiting close to the star on short orbital periods. This is good, as the habitable zone, the distance at which liquid water can potentially exist on the planet's surface, lies very close to the star. The problem is, at that distance, planets are almost always tightly locked and keep one side perpetually facing the star. Unfortunately, it is currently unknown whether planets in this configuration can be habitable. It's a very complicated and nuanced discussion that I will save for a future video. For now, my recommendation would be to avoid placing terraformed or evolved worlds into red dwarf systems unless you are prepared to do a lot of research first and then risk your system potentially being proven inaccurate by future discoveries. Moving up the mass and temperature scale, we next come to spectral type K stars, also called K dwarfs or orange dwarfs. Though not as populous as their red cousins, orange dwarfs are the next most abundant type of main sequence star and possess very long lifespans, lasting between 14 billion and 40 billion years, depending on their mass. They too favor the formation of terrestrial planets, but their occurrence of Jovian planets is higher than it is for red dwarfs. Habitable zone planets orbiting orange dwarf stars with less than 0.7 solar masses are likely to be tidally locked, or at least have extremely slow rotation rates. But above this mass, the habitable zone lies far enough from the star that the planets can have what is essentially independent rotation. Also, due to their short orbital periods, orange dwarf planets can have rather large obliquities and still maintain stable climates. If this doesn't make sense to you right now, don't worry, I'll be making an entire video about this subject later on. For now, just know that that's a good thing. Continuing on, we next come to spectral type G stars, also called G dwarfs, yellow dwarfs, or sun-like stars, as our parent star lies within this spectral type. Yellow dwarfs are reasonably abundant stars and have lifespans stretching from around 8 billion to 14 billion years. These stars equally favor the formation of both terrestrial and Jovian planets, and those within the habitable zone lie far enough from the star to have independent rotations and orbital periods comparable to Earth's. 
Obviously, G dwarfs are a good choice for all type of science fiction planets. Next up, we come to spectral type F stars, also known as F dwarfs and white stars, but not to be confused with white dwarfs, which are a completely different object. F stars are rather uncommon in the galaxy and have lifespans ranging from 3 billion to 7 billion years. They also have much stronger stellar winds and emit more ultraviolet light than their less massive cousins, requiring their planets to have strong geomagnetic fields and robust ozone layers to maintain surface habitability. And the long orbital period of habitable zone planets limit them to low obliquities, lest their climates destabilize. Having a habitable planet within a white star system is possible but challenging, particularly the more massive the star. Next, we come to spectral type A stars, also called A dwarfs or sometimes light blue stars. These are fairly rare stars with lifespans ranging from about 1 billion to just under 3 billion years. They lack the stellar winds of lower mass stars, but emit huge amounts of ultraviolet light, making them very dangerous to organic life, lacking sufficient natural shielding. These stars favor the formation of Jovian planets, with terrestrial planets likely being rare in their planetary systems. The habitable zone of A dwarfs lies very far from the star, causing planets there to have very long orbital periods. Rapidly moving up the mass and temperature scale now, we come to spectral type B stars, also known as blue stars. These are very rare stars with lifespans lasting only about 7 million to 800 million years. Low mass B stars heavily favor the formation of large Jovian planets, and B stars above five solar masses likely do not possess any planets due to their high luminosity evaporating the protoplanetary disk before planets can form. B stars have moderately strong stellar winds and emit large amounts of ultraviolet radiation, so naturally habitable planets within blue star systems are unlikely. And lastly, the highest mass and temperature main sequence stars are the spectral type O stars, or dark blue stars. These extremely rare stars can have lifespans of less than 6 million years and luminosities in excess of 90,000 times that of our Sun. As a result, orbiting planets are all but an impossibility in such systems. So these are one of the few star types that aren't suitable for any type of science fiction planet. Hopefully now you have a good idea of what categories of stars you can choose from and which specific star types might be a good fit for your primary inhabited planet. So please give it some good thought, make your choice, and then join me in my next video where we'll start building your star. But if you insist on choosing your star based on its color, at least pick a realistic color. Don't make it green or purple or black or pink. These are stars, not jelly beans. In transmission.